Good afternoon, friends, and welcome to the 2020 Prepare.ai Virtual Conference. I'm Dave Castanero, Technical Director and Co-Founder of Prepare AI. What a fascinating time we live in. Technology is evolving faster than the speed of light, it seems, and changing the ways in which we relate to the world around us. In centuries past, great innovations could capture the collective imagination. Imagine hearing the voice of a loved one on a telephone for the very first time. Imagine seeing the first satellite blink across the sky above, or humankind's first slow motion steps on the moon. Today, it's harder to think of these singular triumphant moments that make the world pause in awe. The fabric of civilization is shifting now so rapidly, at times it's hard to keep up. Big innovations are happening like CRISPR, smart homes, autonomous vehicles, reusable rockets. They still make the headlines, but they happen so frequently now, they almost blend into the background noise. It took a billion dollars and 13 years to map the first human genome. Now you can get yours mapped for three grand in two days. Today is a day to step back and reflect and be inspired by the technologies and the technologists who are shaping our future, a future that's unfolding faster than ever before, from VR and AR at scale to data-driven supply chains. These next speakers are at the very heart of how AI is enhancing the human experience. So find somewhere comfortable, turn off your Slack, and tune in to hear how some of the world's leading minds and organizations are changing the ways in which we work, play, and live. Welcome to Prepare AI's AI at Work and at Home event. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> and welcome everybody to the fourth day of the Prepare AI conference. And welcome to the great panel that we have focused on data science at scale. Just a quick note about me, my name is Andy Sweet. I um, sit on the Purport Prepare AI board. I lead Darty's product and innovation organization, which includes our product leaders, our data scientists, data and software engineers. But most importantly, Darty's a proud platinum sponsor of Prepare AI. It's been an amazing conference so far, covering areas from workforce development on day one. Hopefully you got a chance to tune into that, and if not, you can go to Prepare AI and actually see the recordings. Topics on day two around our planet and beyond, health and well being. And the focus for today is AI at work and home. If you missed any of the sessions, like I say, please feel free to go to the Prepare AI website and they're available for five months uh, for all of you to see. I want to mention though, there is one session this afternoon at 4 15 with St. Louis native Marlon West. He is uh, head of Disney effects, head of effects at animation at Disney. and is has their own particular approach to talent and content. So this is a one-time event. So tell your friends, bring your kids. And this is uh, one not to be missed. So, so to set this panel up, I just wanted to say, and maybe echo some of Dave's words, you can sense every day, and especially if you've been watching this conference, AI is transforming how we live, work and play every single day. And the pace and scale of AI's transformation is only accelerating. And that's the focus, is, is the scale portion of this panel, focusing on scale. And I'm pleased to say that we have a panel of industry leading experts. And I'm gonna start by introducing Naveen Singla. Naveen is the VP of Data Science at, at Bayer Crop Science. He runs a over 500 strong data science community at Bayer and they're working on sustainable innovation in the agriculture and really transforming the agricultural industry. And one of the great things about Bayer is they're committed to the idea that science, you can use science for a better life. And you're gonna hear a lot more from Naveen about that as, as the afternoon progresses. Secondly, I'd love to introduce Chris Lamuth as head of enterprise data science at Express Scripts. He's a seasoned data science and technology leader uh, born here in St. Louis, went to Wash U, extensive experience with technical teams in Fortune 50 enterprises. And Chris has worked in the healthcare space for over 11 years. He's part of improving the health, well being, and peace of mind of those we serve. And finally, Ernest Smiley, uh, as Chief Data Scientist of Kingdom Capital, Ernest is focused on data science, artificial intelligence, and predictive analysis in the healthcare. Uh, 
Earth's ecosystem as well. He has a 25 year career, stellar career with NASA, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, CIA, Department of Energy, and General Dynamics. So welcome to my entire panel. So let's get started. <clears throat> Naveen, probably I'm, I'm gonna start with you. And maybe before we dive into the scale aspects of your work, would you kind of give the audience a sense of the kind of problems you and your team are solving or the kinds of solutions that you're bringing to the bear business? Absolutely, Andy. And thanks for that wonderful introduction. Really generous of you. Uh, so at Bayer, uh, the corporation, our vision is health for all, hunger for none. And I'm part of Bayer Crop Science, like uh, Andy said. We're the leader in agriculture. And our mission is to deliver world-class innovation to agriculture, um, setting new standards in sustainability through digital transformation of agriculture. So it's all about shaping agriculture for the future. And um, my team of data scientists, we're working on developing solutions to help improve our product. So we, we develop a lot of seed products, a lot of chemistry products for farmers. Um, also, how do we improve the efficiency of our operations in our supply chain? It's a multi-billion dollar supply chain. So anything we can do to get the product out to the farmer faster and cheaper, it's, it's great. And it's all about the farmer, right? I've already mentioned that a couple of times. So how do we transform our customer's experience? All <laughs> while reducing the environmental footprint. So no, no small task here. I, I give a couple of examples of what we're doing here. Right? One is um, what we like to call tailored solution, the essentially personalization of agriculture. The thesis there is no two farms are identical, no two farmers are identical. The way that somebody farms is different than how their neighbor farms. So the solutions that we provide to those farmers for those farms based upon their soils, based upon their risk-taking appetite, based upon their goals, need to be personalized. And that's where we're trying to bring in all of the environmental data, all of the genetic data, all of the um, data about the farmer's behavior to try to create those personalized recommender systems for our farmers. And the second example, as I mentioned, is that optimization of that multi-billion dollar supply chain that we have. So again, creating that robust automated production manufacturing system, which helps us to better forecast the demand and better serve that demand through solutions like digital twins through solutions like um, machine learning, all built on top of digital um, capabilities like UAVs and internet of things. So it's a, it's a wide variety of things that the team focuses on. And uh, it's, been, it's been superb to see how that evolution from concept to, uh, to uh, execution to scaling is happening. I'm tremendously, tremendously psyched to be here to talk about the scaling aspect of that. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, Naveen. And, and Chris, I'll go to you next. Um, and and I, I guess maybe a twist on this. Chris, are you starting to see, you know, the ability to deliver solutions that maybe would have been impossible or at the very least prohibitively difficult to do as you talk about what you're doing at, at, at Cigna and Express Trips? Sure. Thanks, uh, Andy. And, and also, thank you for the, the fantastic introduction. Um, yeah, the Technology is rapidly evolving, um, as we all know. Uh, that's new. That's that's nothing new. Uh, but the access to data sets, um, the access to usable data sets in a usable state, um, is advancing every year. So in our case, um, Express Script Cigna. Prior to the merger with Cigna, we were dealing with, or we had access to approximately twenty-three petabytes of healthcare data, and that's only growing uh, now that we've merged with Cigna. So. I'd say what we've been able to do um, today versus what we were uh, charged to five years ago is you know, develop even more nuanced models uh, at the patient level to help us pick up on patterns that um, you know, create higher precision uh, targets that um, will help drive uh, simplicity, affordability, and predictability in healthcare, which is really our mission uh, at ESI Cigna. So uh, dealing with this data at scale is, is really the biggest change. I'd say second to that, um, the other change is, is adoption from our business partners. Um, 
when data science was a relatively nascent uh, uh, practice in, in um, corporate America, you know, adoption and education on what these algorithms and what machine learning and AI was and what it could do in terms of value uh, was still very new uh, five years ago. And every year that we develop solutions and we prove that value proposition, uh, we get broader adoption across the business. And with broader adoption becomes um, uh, greater gains in, in uh, the, the value that this technology and this, this approach brings. So we've seen a lot, um, a lot of growth in those areas, uh, just access to data and adoption, I'd say are probably two biggest ones from our perspective. Yeah, no, that, that makes uh, sense, Chris, and thank you very much. And, and Ernest, you kind of have an interesting kind of perch to kind of see this question around <coughs> the art of the possible and how that's advancing. Uh, would love to get your perspective on this as well. Yes, again, thank you, and thanks everyone for the introduction. Um, it's very much appreciated. Um, the uh, art of the possibility, especially across data science, artificial intelligence, continues to grow in the complexity of, of the uh, data and need of structured and, and unstructured data. It's very important, especially in the healthcare field, which Kingdom Capital has a great uh, footprint across the uh, cyber, also in with talent management. But I'm going to focus on the whole healthcare whole impact. Um, we're now developing the algorithms and impact for cancer goggles, which was developed here in St. Louis area at Washington University. The impact uh, as far as our being able to see cancer anywhere in the body and then using artificial intelligence to enhance the um, patient's experience uh, during surgery and uh, post-surgery is very important. But the uh, data that's, uh, that's uh, gathered today, as far as uh, images are concerned, MRI, CAT scan, is gonna enhance that whole capability, especially uh, because with the cancer goggles, you can see the, when the body is open. Uh, that whole uh, impact and piece and stuff becomes very Im important as far as the growth or, uh, of artificial intelligence, especially machine learning and deep learning whole footprint. And the, uh, also what we have um, had, had some really some sets with uh, being impactful as far as cyber is concerned and also being very impactful uh, across the whole talent management when we, when we can use artificial intelligence, deep learning to decide uh, to support uh, decision uh, uh, process as far as careers in the, um, in the growth in, in, uh, as far as students at the high school and college level. Thank you, Ernest, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And so as we kind of shift from kind of what we can do, um, the, the, the topic here is scale. And there's so many ways you can define scale. And, and you know, on one hand, you can think about the number of models you have in production. Maybe you can think about the level of adoption across the organization. Uh, Chris, you talked about the amount of data. Naveen, I'd be interested in how you think about scale and maybe some of the, the challenges you faced as you scaled that you could help our audience avoid potentially um, based on your learnings and your journey. Absolutely. So yeah, building off of what Chris already said, data, right? So, and, and IBM had a lot of vocabulary on this, the volume, variety, velocity of data. So that certainly is one way of thinking about scale. The other way that we, uh, think a lot about at Bear Crop Sciences is business decisions being impacted. It's a surrogate for the number of models, but it's obviously not one-to-one -one always. And it's also a surrogate for adoption, uh, but it really ties the impact um, that your models are having, that your data are having directly to how the business is operating differently. But then the ultimate level at which we think about scale um, is, is the customers that we are impacting. And it obviously defines the business decisions you're trying to impact and the data that you're trying to collect. But it also, and this to your second question, Andy, about the, the challenges or um, pitfalls, I guess, is it helps you focus on what are the things that you need to do. So give you an example there again from uh, agriculture when you think about a farmer you know there's every possible diversity there that you can imagine in terms of we have 
large commercial industrial farmers in the US and that own tens of thousands of hectares of uh, land and manage that. And then you have really, really small farmers from where I come in India that have that farm a, a hectare or less. So the needs of, of those customers, of those farmers are extremely different. And understanding those needs, understanding the, the solutions that we can drive to help a smallholder farmer in India are going to be extremely different than what you want to do um, for a corporate farmer in the US. So again, that start with that customer in mind and then work backwards towards how you want to change the decisions in your business and then what data, volume, variety, velocity that you need to be able to address those. Yeah, I love, I love that point of being around starting with the customer. And I think that's one, uh, if I'm in the audience, I'm writing that one down, is starting with your customer in mind. Um, seems like a, a good kind of North Star. I guess, Chris, from your perspective in, in the healthcare, how do you think about scale? How does your organization think about scale? And what are some of those pitfalls that you're seeing or you've, you've managed to overcome um, maybe with the help of Doherty, um, so, <laughs> um, but, but just for the audience, some of those lessons learned. Sure. Yeah. So really the way we define scale, uh, at Express Script Cigna is, um, being able to develop insights, advanced insights in this case on every single patient, uh, in order to, you know, drive that strategy that I, that I touched on earlier, which is making healthcare, uh, more affordable, um, or predictable. And, and simplifying it. So there's a lot there in those three terms. So doing that at scale requires multiple insights at the individual level um, so that we know when we're developing um, a machine learning algorithm that's going to tell us of some event that's gonna happen in the future, it's attached to Andy Sweet or Chris Knuth or Naveen Single or Ernest Smiley. So doing that at scale uh, or, or, or creating those insights um, on every single patient, especially when you have the coverage that Express Script Cigna has, means that you're developing multiple, sometimes dozens and maybe even hundreds of different algorithms on 90 million plus um, Americans in, in the United States. So effectively um, one in three people uh, we're, we're touching from our, uh, from our platforms and processing claims and from a pharmacy perspective and now from a major medical perspective. So, so um, operating at scale means that we have to deploy models um, or that we are deploying models at the individual level. So some of the pitfalls we run into um, and Naveen touched on these and I think they're great, which is volume and velocity. So I talked about the volume of data that we're dealing with. If I'm, if my team's scoring a couple of hundred different algorithms on an individual and we need all of those algorithms for all 90 million members, you can imagine the processing power that's involved there. So there's some pretty um, spectacular engineering um, feats that our technology partners have achieved. And of course, with the help from, from, uh, from Doherty um, and then, you know, applying the correct algorithm. So I would say if there's one thing, if you're going to write something down here for the audience is that, you know, when you're, when you're in the, the advanced analytics and the data science field, it's not always the uh, most advanced algorithm that, that could yield the biggest value. You have to understand the ecosystem that you're operating within. For example, some of the points I just brought up with volume and velocity, um, and Naveen and, and, and Ernest. Um, but if a simple algorithm will get you the answer um, quickly and effectively from, and efficiently from an engineering standpoint, then you need to pursue that path. You have to uh, balance the engineering concerns with uh, the insight concerns. Uh, because what you don't want to do or, is to harm your core business model with the advanced analytic apparatus that you put on top of it. In our case, uh, we don't want to uh, bring our adjudication platform to its knees uh, because we've decided to, you know, deploy a generative adversarial network or something along those lines um, when a logistic regression would work just fine. So um, yeah. I would say match the method and technology to the problem and try not to overshoot um, over complex uh, methods uh, to what would otherwise be a pretty straightforward question. Yeah, no, that, that's great advice. And Ernest, as I go to you, I wanted to encourage the audience, if you have questions, please feel free to, in your app, to ask the questions. We'll get it to the panelists. 
So again, feel free to ask the panelists questions as I do as well. So Ernest, I'd like to kind of ask you the same thing, but maybe turn the knob a little bit based on, again, your, your position at Kingdom Capital. And, and how do you measure the business value of the models? Maybe they're in your portfolio <laughs> companies. How do you kind of make sure that all, all the good work we're talking about here is actually contributing to a business outcome? And again, thanks, Andy. Um, you know, one of the things that I try to focus on as a chief data scientist, it's like, it's identifying, is quantifying the impact of the data against the customer problem. What, what problem that we are going to solve? And is, is data science is going to solve 50%, 80%, you know, maybe even, you know, close to 100% of the problem? Or if we're going to have to turn back to processes, management, how impact and all. But at, at the end of the day, you have to quantify the actual problem, quantify the impact of the algorithms, the models that you're going to use, and what um, organizations that you can collaborate with in the whole healthcare footprint. Can you collaborate with FDA, CDC, NIH, those type of organizations that are, um, has a whole of a lot of uh, structured data, but sometimes unstructured data, and then where, how, where, and when you can uh, pull into the uh, electronic records uh, uh, whole footprint. How can you use some of that uh, unstructured data? But also, you have to take a look at where you need to develop new data, new algorithms to support your overarching whole impact and uh, overarching goal. And and th does that? increase a values that does that drive impact in the healthcare arena dealing with patient care and patient treatment it does, does it also uh, create an environment where you can uh, uh, pull in revenue so one piece of it you might be doing from a product development whole perspective and another piece you you're probably going to be doing software as a service or creating a service opportunity back into uh, other um, healthcare arena from a whole educational perspective, research perspective, and other commercialization whole impact. Yeah, that, that, that's great, Ernest. And as you were talking, it actually triggered a thought. <clears throat> I'm not sure who to throw this to, so I'm just going to throw it out there. You know, you were talking about the the, the business value or the return on investment um, that you're looking for, and it, it strikes me that you know maybe in in Naveen, your area some of the models you're, you're putting together might need multiple years, especially in, in countries that have annual growing seasons, right? Kind of maybe, uh, this sounds super simplistic, um, but, but try to predict how much corn, soybean, cotton is gonna be produced in a particular country, but that's a yearly thing. And so it could take three, four, maybe longer to get organizational trust around those models. And Chris, with you, I, again, maybe I'm oversimplifying, but. I could imagine a lot of the models are around efficacy of drugs. And again, that could take multiple years to either prove or disprove and even longer to get that organizational trust in the models. So I'm just curious, um, and I'm just kind of throwing it to both of you. How, how do you measure ROI potentially in that kind of environment? Yeah, it's, Andy, it's an excellent question. It's a, every data scientist dream is to say, hey, my model drove this much revenue growth or saved this much uh, money. That attribution modeling, which is a big unsolved problem, is, is everybody's dream. But you're right. It doesn't, it's not that simple. It's not that easy. And sometimes it's not even that possible in the case of agriculture, like you mentioned. So a couple of things that we do, you know, we've talked about this number of models that are deployed, number of business decisions that are being impacted. Um, adoption, those are some of the, uh, I call them lower hanging uh, type of fruits yep. you can go after. I think the other thing is, you hit upon it, right? It's about building trust. It's, it's about making sure that the users, the customers know what they're getting and understand what's in it for them. Yeah. So that one of the key things there that, you know, as I've, as I matured myself, I've understood that experimenting with the customers is the best way to do that versus throwing things over the wall. So how do I yep. get my customer, my user, my end um, consumer into the picture as quickly as possible, work with her or him and develop that solution ideally with in collaboration, but at least experiment that solution 
uh, in collaboration with them so that as we go through that multi-cycle of uh, test and learn, we're getting better, better together, right? My data science yep. model is improving and their outcomes are improving simultaneously. I love that. I love that collaborative cycle. Uh, Chris, I, I guess I'll, I'll ask you kind of the same question, how, how you connect. Uh, Naveen describes it in a, and I have to agree with him. It's like the data scientist dream when you can just connect to hard ROI, but as we all know, that's not that easy. So how do you do that within your organization? Sure, yeah, and, and I'll you know, reiterate Naveen's uh, sentiment here, and this is a fantastic question and, and key to data science and, and data science practitioners. Um, in, in our case, I wanna build on something that Naveen brought up, um, which is experimentation or um, R&D, that kind of, uh, that angle of, of the development and execution process that we deploy here at uh, Express Script Cigna. And, so my team is, is located in the uh, Technology and Innovation Center, otherwise known as the lab. And the whole purpose of the lab is to bring together kind of multidisciplinary professionals in different um, uh, components of the business to solve some of healthcare's biggest challenges. And the, one of the best tools in our toolbox to, to prove value is test and learn. And we call those pilots. And I, I don't think that that's unique to us. A lot of other people refer to them as the same thing. So we start off first with a hypothesis, thinking that perhaps um, a new adherence device, for instance, and when I say adherence, what I mean by that is uh, a patient's uh, propensity to take their medication is prescribed. Uh, it's a very, very, um, very valuable problem to solve. Uh, but if, if there is a number of different manufacturers of devices to help patients with adherence, you know, smart devices, IoT devices, um, even apps on your phone now. Um, what, we think that it will help make a patient more adherent. Um, and we think that it'll help a patient with a specific condition more adherent. Um, you know, starting first with that hypothesis, we then test it through that pilot. And as Naveen said, we're partnering with our, with our uh, business partners throughout the um, entire experiment to make sure that we're learning each step of the way what it is that is making a patient more adherent or less adherent. Um, is it the actual device for, in this particular example? Um, is it something else that Express Scripts is doing? Is it the drug? Is, you know, is there something unique about the patient? All things, um, it's a multivariable problem. But that experimentation yields um, a value statement at the end of the experiment. And that will tell us um, whether or not, in, in our case, and as data scientists, um, whether or not smart targeting or advanced um, analytics is going to provide lift in that particular case. So we use the R&D approach quite a bit, quite extensively to prove out our business cases. Yeah, I, lo I love that point. <clears throat> and again, the thing I keep hearing from all of you panelists is, is that focus on customer and building trust and, and building trust in, in the work we do because many times those, those models might start to tell the business to do things that are counter to human intuition and so if you don't have that trust, it'd be hard to make those decisions change and actually make data-driven uh, decisions. And so Ernest, you know, this is, uh, I really kind of like some of your points. And, I, and I, I know all of us here are really focused on, you know, data for good and, and leveraging the ability to, to create better insights. But as we create better insights, we have greater responsibility on using data in an ethical way and, and what, what safeguards, do you, do you have you know, recommendations for your portfolio companies or do you just have general recommendations around safeguards that you believe we should have as an industry or as organizations? Again, as we get more sophisticated in the insights we can develop as we grow the scale, how do we make sure we're being ethical in what we do? I mean, those safeguards are you know, much needed, especially in the health and medical whole footprint as you know, it's proven over the last few years within within cyber and uh, investment finance whole uh, whole pieces that that we we continue to uh, uh, continue to communicate. One of the things that I try to focus in in is that uh, how and where we can partner with organizations like NIST, National Standards and uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology. <clears throat> how we can how and where we can partner with other organizations uh, as far as um, like uh, FDA, what are, what are some of their standards as far as data and, and, uh, and receiving and transmitting data? 
across some type of electronic uh, whole footprint, how we can partner with uh, organizations like NIST and then look across other organizations and, and, and as we're doing with this panel, look across other experts in, in this whole area. And so because the ethics of data is gonna be, uh, along with policy, is gonna be one of the um, unique uh, separators as we're building uh, products and services, especially in the whole healthcare uh, whole arena, because our focus is, is um, actually reducing, you know, uh, excessive death uh, we, uh, with patients identifying therapeutic targets, you know, these are, we have to make sure that we get the, the target right and stuff. Identifying risk factors, uh, the data, artificial intelligence, deep learning, uh, machine learning can really uh, help us develop in, uh, personalized uh, medicine, personalized treatment, and supporting some type of decision or footprint. But we have to get, we have to get the right ethics in the data plays a very important part of this. Yeah, Ernest, I love those points. Naveen, as I go to you and Chris, <clears throat> um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna throw in a maybe a provocative wrinkle. Um, we oftentimes, you know, I mean, I think we can sometimes conflate ethical use of data with regulatory, the regulatory environment. Ideally, the regulatory environment leads to an ethical use of data, but, but has, has HIPAA gone too far is GDPR going too far and actually inhibiting innovation that could be helping all of us in our daily lives and the work you're doing to help feed the world, uh, make us more healthy, et cetera. And again, I know it's a little provocative, so I just thought I would throw it out there as you consider the question. So it's a great question, right, Andy? And again, thinking from the customer's perspective, thinking from the user's perspective, they care about, maybe I'm simplifying for the sake of the conversation, they care about privacy, they care about the security, and they care about transparency. So ensuring that their data privacy rights are going to be respected, right? So they own their own data at the end of the day. I own my own data at the end of the day <laughs> is what I, what I want to know, right? And yep. I want to know that those data are secure. If I hand my data, uh, whether it's a farmer, me, whoever, it's going to be in a system that is not going to be open to vulnerability. So obviously there's a lot of effort being put on cybersecurity around that. Yep. And then transparency, which becomes really, really intertwined with this area of data science and machine learning. More and more of these neural network algorithms that are coming out are notoriously hard to interpret as to how they went from the, the input to the output. But guess what? We still want to know, or we still want to have that level of comfort that we're not introducing some unintended consequences, whether it's biases, errors, into the outcomes that we are trying to promote here or predict here. So now coming to the second point, right? HIPAA, GDPR, I think they are, they are valuable. But I think what's happening now, which is really, really positive, is that conversation around privacy, security, and transparency is evolving where it's becoming more and more inclusive. We've got, we've got the considerations of AI being brought into those conversations now. The practitioners, the industries, the ethicists are all coming to the table with the regulators and the other government bodies and the customers yeah. to help create that more holistic set of regulations, those more holistic set of guidelines to help us usher into that new age. Nobody knows what that new age is going to look like, otherwise uh, we would have solved it, but we're doing that together again. I, I love that together point. And Chris, I'm gonna try to, we're, we're getting a lot of questions rolling in from the audience. So we're gonna try to try to combine a few things here. So as we think about this regulatory environment, one of the questions from the audience is, what, how do you come up with the, 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 the questions that you wanna answer as data science teams? And, and maybe, are you running into situations where it's a highly valuable question if you could answer it, but there's no way you can because of a regulatory issue or, or whatever the case may be. I'm, I, I'm trying to bring some concreteness to that notion of there's great questions if we could answer, we could improve the lives of, of our customers, but we can't do it because of a regulatory issue. Yeah, so I think it's a great question. And it's something that, uh, especially in health, care we're, we're acutely aware of. Um, I think 
you know, HIPAA GDPR regulation uh, and, and what it controls um, is, is very appropriate. Um, uh, the amount of uh, uh, constraints that are in place are, are important, um, especially as all of our lives become more and more digitized. And the reason for that is, you know, cross-pollination of data. You know, we're talking about, um, you know, data that are coming from other platforms. Could that or should that be mixed with your healthcare data or your financial data or, um, you know, anything else that may be out there? So I think those regulations are, are well-placed and um, are even more relevant today than they have been in years past, just because of the volume and velocity of data and how, how, um, relatively uh, easy it would be to start blending data sets. So that aside, how, you know, the, the other part of your question, how do we drill into the highest value questions um, to apply data science to? And a lot of it does uh, kind of come back to that R&D approach, but many times, I mean, all of us, we're not, we're not, we're not living in a vacuum. So at Express Scripts and Cigna, we have family, we have friends, we have colleagues who are dealing with some of you know the, the pain points in healthcare that we're trying to solve for affordability uh, predictability simplicity those ideas come from us um, at at the company uh, we know that healthcare is expensive uh, particularly in the united states we know that it can be very confusing um, those of us who work in healthcare and have for many years um, when we become consumers of healthcare services, sometimes you know we find ourselves getting confused um, right. by what's going on. So, uh, it's it's not. Um, I don't think we're at a shortage of high value answers. It's just trying to focus on the highest impact um, uh, questions at, at at you know at any given time. Really asking ourselves which ones are the most realistic. Uh, questions that we can answer. Where can we add the most value in the shortest amount of time? And that's really where we focus. Yeah, uh, Ernest. Yeah, I, I, I'd love kind of your perspective on this because again, you're looking across industries, right? In in your role, and in you know, I, again, I know it's kind of a provocative question, but has the regulatory push? And now it's a patchwork. I saw somebody in the audience; they described it really accurately. A patchwork mm -hmm. kind of quilt. Of, of regulations and as your data goes from Belgium to India to Omaha, Nebraska, it can be subjected to, to very different regulations and how you treat it could fundamentally change. So just curious, you know, from your perspective, has it gone too far? Um, I think sometimes in, in certain in, in industries, especially like when you're pushing innovation, especially in healthcare, uh, because it prevents us from, uh, from being successful. And it's and it's in um, the belief in healthcare, especially in in the overarching data science and that whole capability. Um, it's it's beginning to uh, show some some footprint and impact, but it's it's very slow. The uh, actually technology of, of data science, artificial intelligence, it's ahead of the actual regulatory and policy and processes behind. And as you're pointing towards the um, the whole impact uh, across. Uh, regions and if, even within uh, like for instance drug discovery and patients care and the whole HIPAA footprint you you would come into roadblocks as you're trying to integrate uh, data across that footprint and then the um, the impact as you're trying to push innovation especially in approval through organizations like FDA you're you're gonna um, you're gonna come into some some limitations but I, I think there's a lot of progress has been made, especially over the last few years in that whole footprint. I know, like for instance, uh, just recently in the last month, like FDA has a chief data officer, which they didn't have before. And those organizations that are gonna be supportive of data and the integration from that whole footprint. So, yeah, I, I love that point. Yeah, I love that point. And then that's the hope, right? As we continue to evolve, all of our institutions evolve with us, public, private, and academic. And as I, I'm going to kind of switch gears a tiny bit, and boy, 40 minutes flies um, when you have a great discussion. And so we have about five minutes left, but I think it is vitally important to address how do we get a more diverse and skilled workforce in this next generation of technologies. And Ernest, I want to start with you and then go around the horn, but I, I think this is our great opportunity of our time, my perspective. Um, is to is to grow the pool of talented and diverse diverse 
individuals that can contribute to this new economy. And we'd love to get your thoughts from all the panelists on this topic. Ernest, starting with you. Uh, from, from a data science perspective, no matter what organization or group you're in, learn data science. It's going to be as important as uh, learning how to use a spreadsheet or PowerPoint in the future and encourage um, any and everyone to take advantage of any any programming perspective and in, in becoming a, an actual data scientist, sharpen your skills at least in one field as far as a, a programming now it's Python, or, but learn like as much as about programming as possible. Learn as much as about statistics as, as possible. Learn as much as about mathematics because it's gonna put you in a position where you're, at a, you're gonna be the expert. But even from a whole data science perspective, learn and, and have an understanding from a customer perspective, have an understanding of how, in this case, data science can impact or enforce or create opportunities as far as products and services uh, for, for the, your organization, your, your whole school district, and your whole industry. I think that's the most important thing. And Ernest, I, I mean, you know, what, what, what the world needs is, is more role models. How did you get to where you are? I mean, and again, I know we don't have a lot of time. I wish we had another half hour to discuss this, but, but quickly, how'd you get to where you are? Because you, you've been a leader across the board, and, and I think you'd be an inspiration for a lot of people. So how did you do it? Uh, having, having a, a great uh, a mentors uh, that, that, uh, that, uh, put put me in the path as far as in this case as far as data science, but but having enough footprint across being a chief architect, uh, systems engineer, and uh, uh, learning and understanding the whole field of uh, of data science and uh, and and computation as it as it applies itself across business out opportunities. Uh, I've had uh, opportunities to serve as I mentioned uh, as far as uh, office of secretary of defense. Uh, identifying um, uh, prison of war or uh, lost individuals in, in all, all across, all, all the way from Vietnam to, to forward and stuff and using data science, artificial intelligence to, uh, to enforce that. Working with, in this case, and stuff with cancer goggles, working across talent uh, ma management. But my whole uh, understanding, I, as I approached data science, it was my understanding to, to learn as much as I could about the core fields of data science and how it can apply from a program perspective all the way from business opportunities and understanding that and being impactful in that whole footprint. That, that's really powerful. And to be, I'm going to go to you next, but, but I think that's the call to action in all of us as experienced data science practitioners and leaders is to be mentors. And so I, I love that point. Naveen, I know this is a passion area for you. We've talked about it a lot. Would love to get your thoughts. Yeah, I read on the internet, since everything on the internet is true, that you know, <laughs> the question often gets asked that, what is the best time to learn data science? And the answer was the best time was 10 years ago, but the next best time is now. So <laughs> I love that. get started. The tools are out there, the courses are out there, the platforms are out there. What you need is the motivation. What you need is to set your mind to it. And Andy, the beautiful point that you made that we need mentors. We need people who can help guide people through that journey because maybe there is too much information out there. Um, but yeah, uh, take the plunge and uh, you'll, be, you'll be better for it. That, that's a great point. And, and Chris, we have about 60 seconds. Um, and I, again, I know this is a passion area for you as well. And we could we could go another half hour, but. Yeah, no, thank you, Andy. Um, absolutely. So Ernest and, and Naveen touched on a lot of great things. Um, the educational landscape is shifting, uh, especially now in the current landscape with the pandemic. Uh, materials being digitized. Uh, there's a lot of online coursework. I would just say, if you're getting into, if you want to get into this field, prove by doing. Just get your hands dirty, um, develop a project and have something tangible that you can talk to. Um, uh, when you when you are approaching uh, leaders in the field. Uh, the other thing is that uh, companies have a responsibility to be accessible. You know, I'm a huge advocate of the mentorship that Ernest and Naveen have brought up, uh, but those those companies need to be accessible to the communities who could benefit the most from those mentors. I love that. I love that. that that's a great call to action. And we do need to close. <laughs> 
but I want to thank you as panelists. Uh, this was an amazing conversation. The time flew by. I hope everybody in the audience enjoyed it. I know we had a lot of questions um, that I wish we could get to, and we'll, we'll maybe uh, talk to Cindy about getting, getting you some of those answers. But I have to tell you, there are a lot more great sessions today, so stick around. It's all around about AI at work and at home. So enjoy the rest of the conference. And remember, the entire event is free and it's open to all. So tell your friends, it's not too late to have them join right now. And again, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you, you know, Marlon's presentation at 415 is not gonna be recorded. So, so please go see it. Um, but for the rest of, of the sessions, they're gonna be out on the portal for the next five months. So let your friends know. Thank you so much for joining. Talk soon. Thank you.